I'm Peter Bergen of New America. Um, and delighted to uh, introduce and, and moderate this event for the new book, Terror in Transition, Leadership and Success in Leadership and Succession in Terrorist Organizations by Tricia Bacon and Elizabeth Grimm. Uh, the authors are here. Tricia is a uh, pro associate professor at the School of Public Affairs at American University. Uh, and she also previously spent uh, a decade working on counterterrorism issues at the, at the uh, Department of State. Elizabeth Grimm uh, is also an associate professor. She's in the security studies program at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. She's also the author of How the Gloves Came Off, Lawyers, Policymakers, and Norms in the Debate on Torture. And also she worked in the defense and security sector of the US government previously. So Elizabeth and Tricia handed over to you and uh, they're gonna talk about some of the big themes of the book and then I'll engage them in the discussion. I'll also be taking audience questions through the Slido function. So if you have questions, just submit them and I'll uh, ask the authors the, those questions. So <clears throat> over to you. Great, thank you so much uh, to New America and especially to Peter for hosting us today to talk about um, our new book, Terror and Transition. And what we thought we would do just to kick off the event is give an overview of the book overall. What, what was the sort of impetus of it? what we look at in terms of founding leaders and successors, briefly tell you about our case studies and our findings and some of the policy implications of them. But we're of course uh, excited to take Peter's questions and hear any questions that the audience has as well. And it, leadership of terrorist organizations is one of those um, topics that gets a lot of really uh, in-depth coverage. Uh, you know, Peter, among those, have, has written some of the best works on, on specific leaders like bin Laden. And we've, there's been a lot of really um, excellent work done on individual leaders and understanding who they are, what their background was. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of work that looks at decapitation, either from the same perspective, an individual organization perspective, or sort of large end studies about the effects of leadership decapitation. But what Liz and I wanted to do with this book was sort of provide a framework that people could use to systematically look at leaders across different terrorist organizations that moved a little bit away from the, the sort of in-depth focus or the large end focus that we have on, on some of these organizations and ask ourselves some fundamental questions about the role of founders in terrorist organizations and the different types of successors that can emerge based on these founders and how we should think about them. And for most of us who follow terrorist organizations, we know a lot about the founders. These are these, you know, everyone could name some prolific founders. These are the, the leaders that get a lot of attention um, in terms of especially religious terrorist organizations, where they have this particularly prominent role um, in terms of being sort of a prophet and a preacher at the same time, even when they don't have religious credentials. But what we wanted to do was look at what is the core um, function, what is the core role of founding leaders? In addition to being these very visible leaders, these leaders who have a lot of things like charisma and very interesting personal backgrounds. So what we argue is that the way to think about founders, in addition to understanding them on that individual level, is to understand them as the core foundation of an organization that establishes two things, that establishes the why. Why does this organization exist? Why fight? Why kill? Why, why be willing to die? What is sort of the ideology, the political motivation, and the framing that is driving the organization to exist and mobilizing and motivating supporters and recruits? And at the same time, they establish the how. And amongst the how, and important for our, our purposes, is using terrorism. Um, but a lot of these organizations don't just use terrorism. They're also engaging in everything from social services to governance um, to running in, in elections, as well as using insurgency and other forms of violence. So what we see is that founders are really serving this core role of establishing this how and this why for organizations, which becomes the basic foundation that every successor then operates from, and which shapes the kind of successors that we see come after a founder is in most cases killed or maybe steps down or is overthrown. And with that, I'll turn it over to Liz. Thanks, Trish. And I just wanted to echo the comments of, of thanking Peter and thanking Angela and, the new, and new America. So just to pick up where Trish left off, this slide sort of gives the context for what we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes, which is to what extent does the successor follow the how and the why that the founder created? We're going to talk about the ways in which the successor makes choices about incremental change versus discontinuous change and sort of the way the counter-terrorism pressure is an overlapping factor. 
whether these groups are existing in a high counterterrorism space or a low counterterrorism space. So let's get into it. So the next slide lays out for us essentially the choices that successors have. And we are not interested in simply who that successor is, but we're interested in the way they lead. Will they continue to take the organization in the same direction that the founder intended, that the founder laid out, or will they take steps to change that organization's how and why? And so we argue that the change that a successor takes can take two forms. It can take incremental change or discontinuous change. And what we mean by that is that incremental change, this is change that is not altering the sort of fundamental nature of the group. These are changes that do not challenge or upend the existing how and the why. And in many cases are a sort of natural progression of what the founder intended, a sort of natural evolution. And so an incremental change to the why, for example, could look like highlighting a recent action or recent behavior by the adversary in an attempt to discredit them. An incremental change to the how could look like increasing the use of one tactic over another, but a tactic that was already in that group's repertoire, or digging in more deeply to one way to gather resources, to raise money. Discontinuous changes, however, these are changes that radically change the how or the why, or both. And so these are really, these are game changers. And so we have on the slide here that there are discontinuous changes to the why and discontinuous changes to the how. So discontinuous changes to the why could look like emphasizing a new adversary as the primary opponent. Whereas discontinuous changes, the how could look like conducting operations in a new place, a new, entirely new tactic to raise money. And so again, layered onto these two factors as we move forward is the impact of counterterrorism pressure. And so our next slide details the recognition that counterterrorism behavior, counterterrorism actions influence the successor's decisions, influence the leadership type, and what we mean by that is that these counterterrorism actions, they shape the operational environment that the group is operating in. And so in addition to accounting for the way that the successor makes decisions about either staying with the same how and the why as the founder, we also looked at the environment. Is the group under intense CT pressure or not? And so by that I mean groups that are existing in a low counterterrorism space, they have the freedom to undertake all of their core activities. So this is recruiting, this is raising money, this is training, this is communication. They can undertake all of these activities without fear of counterterrorism action against them. And we can trust that, for example, to leaders' decisions and leaders' roles in a high counterterrorism space where they cannot operate freely, when the group is existing in a constant state of fear, of constant state of worry about betrayal. So the illustration that we have here in one of the cases that I'll talk about later is the case of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad that we chose for one of our in-depth case studies and it was in part because the counterterrorism pressure that they faced varied, whether they were at home in Egypt or abroad. At home, they faced crushing almost crippling amounts of counterterrorism pressure to the extent that at one point you have, you know, virtually all the senior leadership is imprisoned versus abroad, there's a much greater freedom of movement and freedom of action. So our next slide talks about the interaction of these factors. And this is the big slide, my friends. This is, this is the argument. The interaction of these factors, incremental or discontinuous changes to the how and the why, we found produced four main leadership types. And we added a fifth at the bottom. So I wanna walk through all of these. So when we found a leader that wanted to continue that trajectory of the founder with only incremental changes of the how, and incremental changes in the why, that leader is a caretaker. These are individuals often who, for whom authority and prestige and legitimacy have been passed down to them from the founder. And so they're only making minor changes to the how and the why. The second line down shows the signaler. So the signaler is making discontinuous changes to the framing, again, that's the why, but only incremental change to the how, to the tactics and the resource mobilization. And so what does a discontinuous change to the why or the framing look like? Well, this means changing the rhetoric, changing the propaganda, changing the messaging used to explain the group's why. Changing, for example, a, a pledge of affiliation to another organization would be a classic example of a signaler. 
In contrast, if you have a successor who's only making incremental changes to the why, but discontinuous or disruptive changes to the how, the tactics and the resource mobilization, that leader is the fixer. So what this might look like in practice is, for example, turning to tactics that have never been used before, introducing IEDs or introducing female suicide bombers, if that hadn't been part of the original repertoire of action. It could also look like moving to a completely different area to raise money, to recruit. Then we have this fourth type. Visionaries are the leaders who are making discontinuous or disruptive changes to both the why, which is the framing, and the how. And so this could look like proclaiming the formation of a state and then introducing governance into that group's repertoire of action. Now, I said at the bottom, the intersection of these factors give rise to four groups, four types. But one of the things that Trisha and I wanted to represent was that sometimes leaders are not actively choosing change or they're not actually actively choosing continuity. Sometimes groups are existing in periods of silent leadership. And so we added that fifth category at the bottom of figureheads in which the leaders are absent. They're not making any either incremental or disruptive changes to the framing. They're not making any incremental or discontinuous changes to the tactics and resource mobilization. Rather, they're not making decisions at all in some cases. And this situation could emerge for any number of issues. It could emerge because the leaders are imprisoned or have health issues or in exile. And so just to recap, just so that everyone has it sort of front of mind, because this is the take home of the theory building that we did with our examination, is that we have five types of successors. The caretakers who make only incremental changes to the why and the how, the signalers who make discontinuous changes to the why, but only incremental changes to the how, fixers who make disruptive changes to the how, but only incremental changes to the why, visionaries who are changing both the why and the how, and figureheads who are not actively choosing change or continuity. And so what we wanted to do was to dive in deeply to certain cases to examine the validity of our theory. And so our final sample actually included 33 organizations that span more than 100 years, more than 90 different leaders, and more than 20 different nation states. And we developed a sample of religious terror organizations. And this sample included groups that had conducted at least 10 attacks, that had at least 50 members, and that operated at least two years. And then layered onto that was the factor that we had to be able to discern in open sources information about the leadership of these organizations. We wanted to pick organizations that had a varying length of time. So we wanted to have, for example, leaders that had short tenures and long tenures. And we wanted to have leaders whose leadership represented a different temporal time period. So spanning back in, in one case, more than 100 years. And so we have four case studies, and Trisha will talk later about more details about the other organizations, our mini case studies that we evaluated. But I wanna say very briefly, just a word about our case studies. We have the case of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, the case of the second clan, the case of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic State in Iraq, and the case of Al-Shabaab. And so these four cases taken together range from 1915 to today. And these cases taken together reveal that founder death was the most common reason for succession. And so we actually over-selected in our deep dive case studies for those cases. On the far left, we have the case of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. As I already said, this is a case of a group that experiences profound counterterrorism pressure at home, but relatively comparatively less counterterrorism pressure abroad. And part of the reason that we selected this case is that this is a case of a very short-lived founder, a founder of only two years in the case of EIJ. And we look at the trajectory and the ways in which the the final leader of the organization, Ayman al-Zawahri, has moved the group as a visionary very far away from the how and the why of the founder. The second case that we look at at the bottom here is actually the oldest case that we looked at, the case of the second clan. And part of the reason that we selected this case was both to have a case of a white Protestant organization, also to have a case in the United States, but this is an example of an old group that experienced virtually no counterterrorism pressure. The successor to the second clan ended up moving into the realm of educational politics and electoral reform, but this is a case in which the group is operating with virtual complete impunity. We have the case in contrast of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, eventually the Islamic State in Iraq, in which the group is existing under 
relatively crushing amounts of counterterrorism pressure through the duration of its tenure. And then the final case at the bottom, we have the case of Al-Shabaab, but also the case of a more enduring founder. The founder of Al-Shabaab we see with a duration of seven years and a case that experienced CT variation over the course of its tenure. And so with that, I wanted to turn it over to Trish to dive into more detail just about these mini case studies that we look at. So uh, we had, in addition to the four cases we looked at in depth, we had 29 other cases that we looked at to, to examine whether these leadership types operated, um, you know, and covered the range of successors that we, we posited, and whether founders were playing the role that we um, argued that they would. So we looked at these 29 other organizations a little bit more briefly, but just to assess their trajectory. And one of the interesting things that we found that when you experience the first initial leadership transition from a founder, most of the time you're going to see a caretaker emerge, which sort of makes sense given the role of what we see founders as playing within these organizations and often the amount of oxygen they sort of take up in terms of the leadership. But there is a fair number of cases where we saw fixers emerge immediately after the founders as well. But when you move into the broader um, succession that goes not just that initial one, but subsequent ones as well, really what we see is all in all, there is a, a tie between caretakers and fixers emerging as the successor type. And it, it provides evidence that generally these groups are a little more conservative than you might think of, given their revolutionary aims um, in terms of not wanting to change too much from what founders establish as well as a, and a willingness to somehow change tactics, change resource mobilization while being more reticent to change some of the other aspects of the group. I think two surprises for us in terms of looking at these succession patterns was the relatively few number of figureheads. Given the emphasis on leadership decapitation for at least the last 22 years, um, as well as years before that, we expected that more leaders might be sort of preserving themselves over leading organizations. But generally, what we found is that was the least common type of successor, that the people who rise to these positions are clearly motivated to play a role in shaping their organizations. We were also surprised to find that visionaries were the third most uh, common kind. So it, it seems when there is going to be changes to the ideology, to the motives, to the framing, that, that there's going to be a change often to both the tactics, the resource mobilization, and the ideology at the same time. So these are the, the significant upheavals that we can see. And we saw this was a real, there was a real divide in terms of visionaries, of whether they were the savior of a weakening organization or they were sort of um, accelerating the, the weakness and the losses that an organization was experiencing. So there was a really wide array of, of consequences for having visionary leaders. And so what does all of this tell us about leadership decapitation? Um, you know, for the since 9-11, the, the policy on leadership decapitation has basically been decapitate when you can, right? And, and understandably so, it's a, it can have a very disruptive effect. Um, and of course, a number of the people involved at the leadership level have a lot of crimes that have been associated with their tenure. But we wanted to think about what is this kind of um, a set, this, this framework for understanding founders and successors, what does it tell us about when we should undertake leadership decapitation and the consequences of it? And one of the things that we would argue is that what we would propose in a, an environment where there is decreasing appetite for counterterrorism action, there's a little bit more concern about the use of airstrikes given um, some of the unintended consequences of it, that there's probably going to overall be a narrowing of counterterrorism, um, use of counterterrorism pressure on leaders and leadership decapitation. But there also can be an assessment process that, that this can help to inform. And the idea that comes to this is to, first of all, recognize the, the consequences of lo the loss of the founding leader, that this is a particularly consequential loss for any organization. The second component of it is to examine the kind of successor that is in place when there is a successor and evaluate their fit for the organization's circumstances. So do you have a caretaker over an organization that needs a more um, uh, active and more rejuvenating figure at the helm? Um, do you have a visionary for a group that's already pretty badly weakened and is likely to be further divided? So assessing this idea of fit between an organization's circumstances and the kind of leader that they have at the helm. And then each of the types that we propose create some counterterrorism opportunities. Um, when you have somebody who is a visionary, who's departed so far from the founder's initial um, sort of how and why, the initial foundation, that creates opportunities to exploit for counterterrorism practitioners in terms of the divisiveness of it. 
or when you have a figurehead who is not doing very much, um, that can be a way to discredit that kind of individual. So each type brings with it some counterterrorism recommendations um, in terms of how you can weaken an organization experiencing a type of successor, as well as how this information can be used to weigh when to use leadership decapitation and when, as counterintuitive as it might be, there are leaders who, while they are in place with an organization, they are keeping the organization in a more static or more weakened situation. Um, so with that, we are, we're keen to, of course, um, hear uh, Peter's reactions and questions and then anything that's coming from our, our folks who've tuned in online. Thank you both. So, I mean, as you were discussing these uh, typologies, I, I was wondering, you know, is Ayman al Zawari, um, you know, who took over from bin Laden, was he a, a figurehead? Was he a caretaker? He doesn't seem to be in very effective. So how, where do you put him in, in this? So you raised a really interesting point. That was one that Liz is smiling because we grappled with a lot, which is that we, we're not necessarily arguing that any of these types are inherently effective or in, ineffective, right? And there are a lot of really interesting debates about effectiveness, including when, when Zawahiri was killed. Was he an effective leader? Was he not an effective leader? And we sort of took a neutral stance on effectiveness. Um, and more, so I think you can have an effective caretaker and an ineffective caretaker, and it's partially a consequence of the circumstances of an organization. So I would agree with you that Zawahiri was a caretaker and alternatively at times probably a figurehead um, when he was indisposed because of counterterrorism pressure. But sort of the questions of effectiveness, I think, are the a next phase in discussions about leadership that are right now very, um, they vary a lot just based on what criteria an individual is using to assess effectiveness. And it can be very intangible, things like charisma, right, which is just very, very sort of difficult to get your hands around. So um, I, I think that we agree with sort of the type that you're proposing, Zawahiri, is, but we remain a little bit at this phase in our, our work on this agnostic about the question of effectiveness. But what we would argue is that Al-Qaeda needed somebody more dynamic, um, that, that there was problems with Zawahiri's caretaking, undertaking it as long as he did, um, which has left the organization in a difficult position after his death. But anything you want to add? And I just want to echo that. We, we struggled mighty to move away from questions of effectiveness, but I think Zawahiri himself is a particularly compelling case to look at because his personality traits from the time that he was a jihadist in the streets of Egypt as a teenager to his death, his personality traits did not change, right? This is a disputatious, no. ungraceful, fractious human. And so we found that a lot of existing treatments of leadership in, in the fields that we studied focused a lot on traits, but Zawahiri as, as a human didn't change, but as a leader, he actually changed mightily from, for example, his final tenure in EIJ in which he becomes a visionary and, and the group ends, right? The group, the group folds with AQ, with Al Qaeda to where we characterized him in the book as a caretaker, in fact, a fairly steadfast caretaker of bin Laden's legacy, and a really good example of a way in which some of these successors who are caretakers, their legitimacy as a leader is exclusively related to their position to the founder, their very direct positioning. Often what we found with caretakers is that if there were cases of successors who were family members, they tended to be caretakers, right? A brother or a father to a son. But exactly to Trisha's point, and I just wanna echo, Al-Qaeda might need a visionary, but that doesn't mean that they will necessarily get one. And what we found time and time again is that sometimes there was a mismatch between the type of leader that the group would actually need and then what they ended up, what they ended up having. And I think it is hard with a group like Al-Qaeda in which the founder still looms so large to think about a visionary who would be effectively, who would be poised to take over the group in that way. You know, we had Jerry Van Dyke, uh, who's just got a new book on the Akhanis, and he offered Siraj Akhani, who's the Minister of the Interior, who um, is the acting, uh, you know, acting Minister of the Interior, but also, according to the UN, a member of the leadership of Council of Al-Qaeda, which is actually a very interesting idea. It would be a non-Arab leader of Al-Qaeda, but obviously somebody, he's the first member of Al-Qaeda who's been appointed to a cabinet position and he's arguably the most important person in the country. Yeah, and I also think Sirajuddin Haqqani is an example of the, the caretaker taking over the Haqqani network, as we, we at least call him in the United States, from Jalaluddin Haqqani. So there is sort of that like family inherited uh, legitimacy. And you also see that in the Taliban with Mullah Omar's son taking a prominent role within the organization. So yeah. there certainly can be that kind of family 
Um, uh, Bin Laden and Zawahiri sort of created it between each other through this deputy role and this extended tenure. But in other cases, we really just frankly see it handed down through sons. Yeah, now I see nice. daughters for some reason, not as often with daughters. <laughs> now, now I see your sort of agnostic on effectiveness because a caretaker can be effective in the case of the, the Taliban right now. I mean, they, <laughs> they're, they're, they're being very effective, but they're not, it's not that they've suddenly kind of changed their mission or their tactics or. That's that right. is exactly the point. And we think no matter the archetype, we would argue they're effective caretakers and ineffective caretakers, right? There would be effective signalers and ineffective, but that's part of the reason we wanted to move away from it because it was it was indeterminate, right? It didn't really tell us that much about how that individual would function in that role. Well, let me ask you about, so it's puzzling, uh, I'm sure to you, both of you, that Al-Qaeda is still leaderless. Uh, you may recall that when Bin Laden was died, there was a six week sort of interregnum where they appointed, according to um, some reporting that, we, that I did for CNN, they appointed Saif al Adil, who's sometimes mentioned as possible number, you know, number one today. Um, but they had a process, and then the, you know, Ayman al Zawahiri was the designated successor, and then he was, you know, he became. So why had they? I mean, it's very hard to know because it's <laughs> all very opaque. But I mean, a, you know, any thoughts on why they haven't appointed a successor, and b. What does it say about this group that they haven't officially appointed anybody now sort of over it's like eight months later after he's been killed yeah i think i think all of us are surprised it's taken this long i mean i guess i wasn't surprised it took some time because even zawahiri who we all knew was going to be the successor it didn't happen immediately there's clearly some consultation that goes on with the affiliates within the organization and difficult you know always to do that i think at this point um, and my kind of uh, informed speculation on this is, and I saw the UN in the UN report, which I'm sorry you, you saw too, where they're say, basically saying Saif al Adel is acting as the leader, but he's not being announced as such. And I think that's a plausible scenario and that either, no matter what his circumstances right now, it would be difficult for Al Qaeda to announce him. If he's still in Iran, it's delegitimizing for the organization to have their leader be in Iran. And if he's in Afghanistan, the Taliban may not want him to be announced as the leader and to show that they have Al Qaeda's leader. And that's a very, that's a very good explanation then. That, that, ex that, ex that explains it. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, I think that, I think that explains it because it's like, Saif al Adil would be a probably quite an effective leader compared to Ayman al Zawari, and it would be very embarrassing for the Taliban for a public announcement if he's indeed in Afghanistan, which seems pretty likely. And if he's still in Iran, that would be very good for you know for anybody uh, in Iran either. So yeah, that's a very that sort of explains it, I think. And I think one of the things that we've sort of mulled over is what kind of leader would Saif al Adil be? Right, what, what, where would he sort of fall in the archetypes? And one of the things that Trish and I discussed is, I mean, it is, it is somewhat unknowable, but given his sort of deep experience uh, as a military operative, given his opposition to the 9-11 attacks, it's entirely possible that Saif al Adel, if he assumes the leadership publicly, could be more of a fixer for Al Qaeda at this juncture in their evolution. Yeah, and that would also suit the Taliban on you know not to have somebody plotting to <laughs> attack <Exactly. them. laughs> um have you i mean i just is sort of a side side observation but like, you know, there was this recent attack in somalia by u.s special operations which they killed this guy al sudani who was a leader of isis who apparently was funding other parts of the isis network what's your take on 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 what what that achieved or I think that's a really interesting case. Um, Bilal al-Sudani is, is sort of an anomaly, I would say, when you look at maybe like sort of the jihadist networks writ large. And why do I say that? He's one of those figures. He's, he's a little bit of an inside baseball figure, right? He was part of al-Shabaab and then he defected to the Islamic State, but he wasn't the leader of the Islamic State in Somalia, who's leader. Of, it appears to be more of this um, Karar office that's a facilitation hub. So he's an anomaly in that locally, his death will basically be irrelevant. It won't change the situation in Somalia, the conflict in Somalia, the viability of the sort of already very peripheral Islamic state in Somalia. But where he does seem to likely to have impact is at this regional and international level, right? That he played this facilitation role for um, other ISIS affiliates in, in, um, in Africa, that he had reached into Afghanistan. 
very close to Yemen, where he was located in northern Somalia. So it seems like he might be sort of one of those critical nodes, if you will, in terms of having a relationship. He's been around for, you know, at least a decade in this kind of facilitation role. So he would be trusted. He would be well known. And then the Islamic State is also experiencing his loss at a time uh, where it has recently lost a leader. And compounding that is, we don't know, and the Islamic State doesn't know what they got in that complex. So the intelligence vulnerabilities that could be coming out of this as well will sort of force a whole bunch of people to change their operations, their communications, and go to ground change. And so I think it will have a disruptive effect at this more transnational and regional level that is, is really interesting because it's not usually what we talk about is, oh, this will have an effect locally on operations or on money. I don't think that's the case here. I think this is a much more transnational impact and it will test the Islamic State's ability to reorganize and rejuvenate different ways of operating at a time when it is struggling with having a, a void in leadership, not to the same degree as Al-Qaeda, but a significant void in leadership. Um you know, I've sort of lost track of who is actually in charge of ISIS now because they come and go with such regularity. And and also, you know, they always adopt the sort of the nom de guerre of like Qureshi or whatever to sort of pretend that they're a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad or whatever they need to. But so, I mean, uh, what's your assessment of where ISIS is today? Because the UN, not this recent one report, but I think the one before said there were still six to 10,000 fighters in Iraq, Syria. You've also got the Al Hol refugee camp, which is sixty thousand, mostly women and children, as you know, which seems to be a going to be a ideological breeding ground of future ISIS sort of uh, kids and and teenagers and maybe adults. And then you have ISIS Khorasan in Afghanistan, which seems to be doing somewhat well. So, and what's the state of play? Does it matter that they? I mean. ISIS is a little bit different, maybe than other groups, because these regional affiliates. How much direction do they even take? Are they just sort of, are they just slapping on the patch and sort of, is that the biggest, baddest patch to put on right now? Because I think ISIS Khorasan is often former Taliban members. Uh, so, I mean, what's what's the state of play? What, you know, who's who's running the show? Does it matter? I think with both of the groups, and one of the things that we've talked about in other talks is that we find that both of these groups really are existing at a critical juncture at this place. And a critical juncture as far as their own evolution and a critical juncture as far as how the United States is thinking about its next counterterrorism decisions relative to them. And one of the things, and Peter, I think the question in and of itself is so fascinating, more like who, who are the leaders right now, right? That it's, it's so telling that at this particular moment, we have an organization that I mean, they, they have a bureaucratic process in place for their next leader in no small part because they you know, have to be defended from the, descended from the prophet, but they have experienced so much leadership change and so much transition that this is a group that has a heavily bureaucratized process for figuring out who and what is gonna come next, whereas Al Qaeda does not. And so I think in a very real way, both of these organizations are existing, both, both ISIS and, and Al Qaeda are existing at a critical turning point. And what I think is so fascinating is the ways in which these groups are talked about right now in the United States. I mean, we, we are at a place right now with significantly declining resources spent on counterterrorism. And so one of the sort of concerns that Trish and I both have is that it's possible for both of these organizations who find themselves at this, this perhaps turning point could benefit from let's say relative inattention from the United States and other allies to use this as an opportunity to regroup, to, to delve more deeply, to expand their recruitment networks, to find new opportunities for populations to join simply because of the diversity threats, the complexity threats, and the different strategic environment that we're in right now than we were in the United States more than 20 years ago. Um, let me ask a question about, so, because uh, uh, Tricia raised the question of decapitation. I know there's a whole academic de debate around how effective it is, but I don't think there's any debate. Um, you also mentioned Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, you know, in the sort of 06 to, to 2010 period, like JSOC kind of killed the whole entire middle management of the group. And I think that was pretty effective. So, I mean, just picking up on kind of that point, we were, you know, these groups, so if you're if if we're now in a situation where we may be able to the United States may be take out a commander, but the 
the group is regrouping in Afghanistan or Somalia and the United States is not paying much attention. Um, you know, how, how does that play out? I think one of the ways it plays out, and I think what we saw evidence of during that time period was that decapitation, I think, became seen as a strategy and not a tactic, right? It sort of became the stand in for this is the outcome. This is what we want to achieve rather than this is the means to achieve some greater counterterrorism goal, some greater counterterrorism operation. And one of the things that we found by delving in so deeply, and you're right, this very like deep reservoir of literature in international relations and in terrorism scholarship in particular, is that the results are somewhat inconclusive. I mean, they, there are debates about, does it matter if it's a religious leader or, or a you know, right-wing leader and debates about the tenure, about the, about the geographic space that they're operating in. And we found in no small, no small part that those outcomes were inconclusive in scholarly work, I think because of a lack of understanding about what role did that founder play as far as establishing the how and the why. How close were they to operational change? How close were they to the sort of changing of the mission or the identification with the mission? But I think that question of the utility of decapitation, I mean, one of the things that we found is that it was the central tool, right? It was the central counterterrorism tool spanning administrations, right? It, regardless of what party the leader was in, in the United States. Yeah, I mean, is there anything wrong with that idea? I don't know. Uh, I shockingly with my background no I don't object to that <laughs> but I think that one of the things to sort of in moving forward is to understand when it will be that with limit more limited resources more limited intelligence about these these leaders and which organizations we're going to invest in tracking the leadership there has to be I don't think we can continue to do what we've done for the last 22 years with the amount of resources that are going towards counterterrorism going forward and I think one of the other things that emerges, in, as you were referring to um, ISI, the Islamic State in Iraq, is there was an organization that was fundamentally weakened. We made a similar uh, dent against the Taliban in 2001. We made a similar dent against al-Shabaab in 2012 you know, to 2014. There is a resurgence capability of these organizations that demonstrates that leadership decapitation um, and just broader pressure will only take you so far. Once that pressure is alleviated, these organizations can can resurge again. And they there's they they're one they are these um, they're they're very hard to kill. They're the cockroaches, right, of of terrorist organizations. That these organizations they can go through these periods of weakness and they can resurge. And one important component of that as we saw with the ISIS case, can be a, a leader who comes with a new vision and a new way of approaching the mission. And I think with the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda right now, you have a real dearth in that, in that realm. These are two organizations competing for leadership of the Sunni jihadist movement. And neither one of them can make a compelling claim, given that they're both in weakened situations, and neither one of them has a leader that is um, motivating the broader movement and is really exciting the broader movement. So both of them have to rely on their affiliates. And both of them have affiliates to rely on. That's not inconsequential, but it does keep them in a, a less powerful position in terms of their credentials and their stature within the movement, as long as they don't have leaders who can occupy that kind of uh, position. You, you, so uh, um, you selected religious groups, and I guess I have sort of two related questions. One, why the focus on religious groups? Um, and two, is it because religious groups actually are more sustainable? So, you know, the Weather on the Ground, the Bada Meinhof, the Brigadi Rossi, once those leaders were sort of imprisoned or killed, um, that, you know, they kind of ceased doing business or what? So why did you focus on religious groups and our religious groups? Is it partly because they're more sustainable? There's more for you to discuss. Yeah, I think we selected religious terrorist groups in part because leaders play a much more central role in religious terrorist organizations in terms of what they a leader needs to occupy in terms of offering a vision and having religious authority as well as organizational authority. And there is a, a pretty you know, substantial body of work and evidence that these the leaders of those kinds of organizations are particularly consequential. Of course, that is also the main, has been the main um, threat and main concern for practitioners and policymakers and analysts for a number of decades now. And, and I don't think, even though we have a rise of some other kinds of ideologies, that the religious terrorist organizations are going away anytime soon. Um, so I think it will continue to have relevance. I don't think that we are sort of making a call 
on whether this would be the case for, you know, leftist groups or right wing groups that are not religious or ethno nationalists. I think it's an open question, you know, whether they have the same types or, you know, if you broke it down based on that, whether leadership decapitation would be more or less effective, just because of the sort of unique role that leaders play in religious terrorist organizations in terms of their stature and their influencing um, and inspiring capabilities. And with regards to your second question, Peter, sometimes we found that the religious leaders were quite durable and lasted for a long time, and some of them did not. So there were certain leaders in our sample who had a tenure even only of, of several months, some of the successors. But sometimes we had leaders like bin Laden who have a, an almost sort of remarkable durability as a religious terrorist leader. So David Rappaport famously in 2002 said there were four sort of cycles of, and I, I'll just for the, anybody in the audience, just, I, I'm just going to repeat it very quickly. So, and that and the, they tended to last for a generation. And then they, they petered out either because they were successful or because they weren't successful. And so there was the first wave, the anarchist wave, you know, they killed McKinley, they made it, did, but by definition, anarchism doesn't offer any ideas. So it sort of just sort of expired. And then there was the second wave, which was sort of the, uh, anti-colonial wave in Algeria and uh, Northern Ireland and you know that 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 terrorism uh, succeeded to some the French got out of Algeria the British sort of re you know kind of redid the way that they approached the, the Irish question uh, as it was known then and then there was the Marxist wave the Bragadi Rossi the weather underground in this country etc cetera, etc cetera. and that collapsed to some degree with the collapse of the Soviet Union then you have the religious wave which we're in now and this kind of really goes to this question about so you know, the religious wave seems to have sustained itself for much longer. If we begin it with, I say, the overthrow of the Ayatollah, the arrival of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in 79, you know, the the Anwar Sadat, you know, sort of signing the deal with Carter and the, you know, the, then the Sadat assassination, the attack in Mecca. So that that all happened in 79. So now we're, you know, it's, it's, it's more than a generation later. So can I, can both of you sort of discuss, you know, a, is it, do you think this wave is going to sustain sort of indefinitely? Is it petering out? If it isn't petering out, uh, or why? Um, you know, Taliban now controls Afghanistan again. Uh, you know, on the other side, the Ayatollahs are still in charge of Iran, and that's been pretty durable. Um, and you could say, look, Al Qaeda is in terrible shape, which I think it probably is. ISIS is not doing that well, which is compared to where it was. So, what, where do you score where we are overall? I have to say, Peter, one of the reasons I love this question, I hope that anybody listening knows this is a question that is often asked in the Georgetown Security Studies Program as a comprehensive exam question for the terrorism <laughs> question. And so anybody who's listening who could like scribble the answer down. The question about where we are now is such an interesting one. And I, I wonder if we ever know when we are in, the, like when, when do you know when you're out of the wave? I think 79 is such a good marker because it was very clear to tell that we were at a tipping point of history, right? It was very obvious to tell. But as far as where we are now, part of me is inclined to say that we're at a space of increasing connections between what we would have described as domestic terror organizations and predominantly transnational terror organizations. Part of me inclined to say that we're facing a rise and resurgence of right-wing terror organizations with fascist ideologies and racist ideologies and anti-LGBTQ, anti-Semitic ideologies. Is it a cop-out answer to say that it is all of them? Because I think at this particular moment, the salience of those hateful ideologies is occurring at the exact same time as we have still the repeated endurance of these religious terror organizations. When we were talking about decapitation five minutes ago, all of these groups that their leaders have been decapitated and yet these groups all still exist. These groups are all still around. And so how will we know what the end of that fourth wave will look like and when we are at the beginning of the new wave? I, for me, it was really salient, you know, the backdrop of the book to have. We, we submitted the first manuscript for the book days, four days after the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And then we submitted the final manuscript for the book just around the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And so these two events taken together have really sort of bookended my own thinking about how would we characterize this space that we are living? And I think the short answer, this would be a terrible answer to a comprehensive exam question, but I think the short answer is 
we see the continued persistence and durability of these religious terror organizations in no small part because of the persistence of leadership, because of the ability and, and the opportunity of these successors to take over. But the particular moment and the rise and the salience of these right-wing terror organizations, and in particular, the ways in which these domestic organizations are intersecting both with states sponsoring them, but also other right-wing terror organizations, feels like we're in a different space in 2023. But I don't know what Trish thinks about it. We've never actually talked about it. I think that Brevapore's framework is a good one, but I don't think that the waves are necessarily mutually exclusive. You know, even in 79, we hadn't sort of wrapped up all of, you know, the previous era. So I think there is something of it can be overlap. I don't know what the duration of overlap would be. Um, and I also think that one of the interesting thing about religious organizations is they can groups can have dual identities as ethno-nationalist and religious, as far right and religious, less so leftist and religious, but maybe theoretically. Um, so I, I also think that that's one of the things that makes this an enduring wave is there, yes, there is a rise in, in far right violence, but a component of it, though not all of it, has a religious component, a religious identity or ideology associated with it. Um, and though we see what I think we see with the jihadist movement in particular is a, a Sunni jihadist movement is a, a real adaptability, right? Like there's the, yes, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are weak. And so there is more of a localization um, in some, and especially in a place like Africa, where we really see this unchecked proliferation of Sunni jihadism. And on the Shia side, of course, there's also a parallel state-sponsored um, movement. And so I think we still are in the religious movement. Maybe we're overlapping into a new phase, but I also think the religious um, uh, wave encompasses part of what we're seeing now that isn't entirely distinct from it. Yeah, a question I'm very interested in is, so you have these proxy groups, which are religious terrorist groups, which now control to a large degree, Afghanistan, the Taliban is totally in charge. They're more in charge than they were last time, with no opposition movement to speak of, and much better armed. You have Hezbollah, which is sort of the de facto government of of, of Lebanon, you know, uh, and they have you know, pretty much veto. They're stronger militarily than the Lebanese army, and they kind of have veto power over what the government can do. And then you have the Houthis in Yemen, uh, who are also sort of the de facto government. They control the capital. So, and just when we're talking about leadership, you know, these terrorist groups are actually the leaders of these countries now. <laughs> so, what does that? I mean, what does that? How do you reflect on that? What does it mean? I mean, I think Hezbollah is such a great example and one of the examples that we talk about on our book in which they move to a place of broadening what does it mean to be a member of Hezbollah in order to encompass, they they adapted and, and move forward to change who could be a member, what did it look like to be a much more expansive, simply Lebanese as a definition, right? And I think... That to me shows the power exactly to what Trish said of these adaptations of the ability of these religious leaders and religious terror organizations to occupy dual roles. And often it's the occupying of those dual roles that has, in, that has allowed them to evolve, to remain, to remain relevant and to remain in charge. And exactly to your point, Peter, to remain more capable than many of their adversaries, but also more capable than legitimate political organs of the state. I think it also improves their longevity, right? That those aren't the leaders we see being eliminated very often. And in fact, the state-sponsored um, groups that operate in Pakistan, uh, there were two notable ones that still have founders, so we couldn't even include them. Um, and it's pretty rare in this day and age to have an organization founded before 9-11 that still has a founder. And there are two in that context. So it, it, it does have a, a sort of effect on the leadership, longevity, and consistency, and ability to, to really implement the vision that they have. So I, I think it, it does, in, in some ways, increase the importance of leadership, because there is that greater institutionalization and longevity. Fisher, you're an expert on South Asian terrorist groups, amongst other things. So uh, let's, so what's going on right now? We've well, got this very ironic situation where the Pakistani Taliban is headquartered in Afghanistan, which is now controlled by the Afghan Taliban which is sort of a has been a proxy for the Pakistani government. And yet the Pakistani Taliban are attacking the Pakistani government. And we had a recent attack at a mosque in Peshawar, <clears throat> where a lot of people were killed. So what what is going on? And, you know, um, what does this mean for Pakistan? What does it mean for the Pakistani government? What does it mean for Afghanistan? 
it, it is sort of one of the painful ironies that the Taliban makes this pledge that they will not allow terrorism um, to based in Afghanistan to affect other countries and the country most affected by it is their patron. Um, but I also think it brings into focus that clients are, are never as manageable as they might appear to be. And the Taliban is no exception. My perception was during a lot of the war in Afghanistan, this was a relationship of necessity. There wasn't much affection behind it. There may have even been some fairly intense dislike behind it between the Taliban, the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani state. Um, and so now that the Afghan Taliban is out from under the thumb of the Pakistanis, it, it behaves in this more independent way. So the, the patron-client relationship is rarely one of control, right? It's one of influence. <laughs> it's one of persuasion and coercion, but it's not control. And the Taliban really illustrates that very clearly, um, that it is not going to just be an instrument of, of the Pakistani army or the Pakistani state. And it also reflects that the relationships that were built during the, the war, during the insurgency, those 20 years, you know, when you have Pakistani Taliban fighting with the Afghan Taliban, when you have foreign fighters fighting with the, the Taliban, there are binds that are created during that time that defy sort of our rational calculus of, oh, the if the Taliban was willing to expel them, it would be much easier X, Y, and Z, so they should do it. It's not that simple of sort of an, an economic calculus, if you will, which is something we see in other realms too. I've thought this when we look at that Al Qaeda's affiliates stayed with Al Qaeda even during the ISIS challenge, right? So some of these these kinds of calculations are not easy um, addition and subtraction of costs and benefits. Um, but I do think that the, the the Pakistanis find themselves in a situation that is is a sort of a turning of the tables, where they have a safe haven next door, they have a government unwilling. Um, to take action and only willing to do things like facilitate talks against uh, a militant group striking within their country. And it's it's a consequence, it's a function of the policies that it it had in some ways. Um, and, the, and the Pakistani Taliban is another one of those groups that many people were writing the obituary for after violence declined so much in 2014 and now has resurged. So there's this sort of, and especially in part because of the right leader at the right time taking the, uh, an approach that reunified the fragmented organization. So it also does highlight the importance, I think, of leadership in this kind of rejuvenation. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, sort of the implication of what you're both saying, you know, is that given enough time and space for these organizations, you know, they, they do tend to regroup. Um, and... Uh, there can be a lot of wishful thinking about. I mean, look. I mean, I, I, I was thinking as you were talking earlier about, you know, Zakari was killed in two thousand six, and Al Qaeda in Iraq carry, carried on, took a huge amount of pressure up till two thousand ten. Then Assad, you know, then there was a civil war in Syria. They kind of migrated across the border. Suddenly, they come back. They're ISIS, and they take over, you know, territory the size of the United Kingdom and population the size of Bulgaria. So, and Al Qaeda in Iraq was in terrible shape, I think, in 2010, 2011. So, the policy lesson is what? I think one of the first policy lessons is one of the things we always see, exactly to your point, Peter, after the death of a leader, is that there's a sort of flurry of obituary writing, a flurry of, this is it, we've done, you know, we've done it, we've achieved it. And I think we have to have some caution, right, about writing the obituary for an organization just because the leader or even the founder has been killed. I think our research is not saying necessarily that counterterrorism efforts should exclusively focus on the leader. In no small part because we've seen the durability of these organizations, but rather an understanding of the type of leader that's leading, a type of understanding of the situation, the environment, the operational environment that they find themselves in. And exactly if we sort of loop it back to the point that we said at the beginning of our discussion, with a declining emphasis on counterterrorism in US policy, I think it is even more critical to understand now the type of leader that is being faced. Trish and I both worked in a counterterrorism environment of almost sort of limitless resources. And we are not in that situation anymore. We are not in that post 9-11 world. And so I think what it tells us with, with the diversity of threats, with the complexity of threats, with even fewer resources, if we stop paying attention to the leaders of religious terror organizations, they're not stopping paying attention to us and they will find ways to frustrate the other strategic priorities, which are critical and very important, but they will find ways to frustrate US and allied strategic priorities in ways that we have decades of history of evidence for. Relatedly then, Tricia, so you know the Taliban now control Afghanistan and they're, they're you know, absent some pretty large 
event um, that seems to be likely to last for a while. What what does that mean in your view uh, for these questions? Since so many of these groups are based or have some kind of presence in in Afghanistan, I think South Asia is a, a region to watch with a degree of concern when you have two governments neighboring each other who are sponsoring and, and supporting militant organizations, right? It, it, that is an environment where capabilities can be rehabilitated, right? Where weakened organizations can find the space, low counterterrorism pressure environments to rebuild um, for, for tomorrow. And a lot of these organizations, especially Al-Qaeda, demonstrate a level of patience. And so I think if you give them space, that will be a, a big ingredient that they need to rebuild. And I think that that also creates an environment where, where leaders can be more secure in their ability to uh, manage organizations, whether they decide to take a caretaking versus a visionary type role, it will be a decision rather than one imposed on them from counterterrorism pressure. And so I think um, there's, there's two regions that I'm worried quite a bit about these days, and, and that's Africa, as I mentioned, where you just see this sort of um, explosive uh, growth in jihadist organizations, both Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, affiliates and South Asia, where you do have this mix of two governments that have have had policies of at least permitting um, Sunni militant groups to operate with a level of impunity and a level of safe haven, which I think is is a, also a very dangerous combination. Uh, let alone that they're neighbors in doing so. That's Pakistan and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, is there? thinking out a little bit further is there a sort of set of circumstances where the taliban are going to shoot themselves in the foot and so in a, or you know might that you know or, i mean what's the difference so obviously in iraq and syria isis was able to recruit forty thousand muslims from around the world many of them europeans a few americans they conducted attacks in paris and brussels and turkey and you know suddenly that they had a global coalition assembled against them and they basically they you know more they're not destroyed completely but they're uh, shadow what they once were so you know do you see a sort of future i'm th thinking five years from now the taliban sort of in power these groups are still there they're regrouping suddenly you've got some europeans coming maybe the attacks are being plotted against american targets in the region now how does this play out i think one of the interesting things is i remember in that you know period we were talking like 2010 2011 that there was sort of a lot of talk bin laden was killed the islamic state in iraq is weakened maybe we're sort of wrapping this up and, um, you know, that was a decade after 9-11. And then you have the Arab Spring and you have the civil war in Syria. And there was there was sort of a, an element of circumstances, you know, creating a galvanizing cause. Then, of course, which Syria did to a degree we'd never seen before. So part of what I'm looking at in terms of thinking forward um, about the fu future of the Sunni Jihadist movement is, you know, like I said, who, who wins the competition for leadership and where's the next galvanizing cause for the movement and who is positioned to exploit it? Who is Who really can take it the way that the Islamic State in Iraq was able to exploit the situation in Syria and of course in Iraq as well. So there's an element of unpredictability, I think, to some of that because it's who, you know, what where does the galvanizing cause emerge? Who's able to exploit it? And um, and I, I but I'm I'm of the the view that given enough time, there will probably be some kind of, of situation like that. Um, that one that one organization, maybe even an organization that we're not that aware of today. Maybe we're gonna see the rise of a new organization or a new competitor for leadership of the movement. You know, there's some outside wildcard variables here that I think it's a time to think creatively so that we don't fall too behind um, in assessing where it is in an environment where there's less attention to it. And in that time period, can they avoid self-defeating measures that would trigger overwhelming counterterrorism responses against them? Great. Well, the book is Terror and Transition. Uh, the, you can buy it at the lower, lower right-hand corner in the button on your screen. Thank you very much, Trisha, Trisha Bacon. Thank you very much, Elizabeth Grimm. And good luck with the rest of the book tour. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you to New America for hosting us.